Excellent. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, everyone. I am excited to be here. Like Steve said, my name is Sean Purvis, um, and I'm going to talk to you a bit about the U.S. team, where we are, and where we're going. Um, I've worked in the United States as a United States defense contractor for over 25 years, mainly in the areas of intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and always in support of the warfighter. I joined Connect a whole two months ago, so I am an expert for and ready for all your questions today. Um, and, but I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited about the opportunity to transform our company and build upon the core technology and intimate customer access that we have with a pivot for our, our own sustained profitable growth. I'm gonna take you a bit through our current position. I'm gonna take you a bit through where I see us moving forward. And I hope I can answer, there was someone who asked me earlier, why Kinetic? I hope you understand why I'm excited about this market, about this company and this portfolio, and more importantly, about the team that I get to lead and the team I get to partner with. So let's, first, let's talk a bit about the defense market. And so for the United States, while the continuing resolution created a bit of uncertainty for us in the first half of the calendar year, the United States defense budget was passed with increased spending projections in support of our mission and in support of our allies. The 2022 fiscal year budget was passed with over $782 billion for defense, which was $50 billion higher than projected. $13.1 billion of that was in support to Ukraine. The defense budget had growth in almost all of the portfolio, and so while we know it's a large portfolio, there are a couple pieces of that portfolio that are really unique and keen to us in areas that we want to grow in. Specifically, around $270 million in artificial intelligence, cyber, and data analytics, $1.4 billion in Indo-PACOM, and $124 million in supply chain improvements and industrial base and information technology. We also expect the future budget to be hold strong and it continue to grow, amplified by the very recent events that we saw. Next year's budget is expected to be up to $813 billion in defense and national security spending. And core themes that are, again, important to us will be areas of deterrence, counter-persistent threat, advances in U.S. cybersecurity, defense, research, and development spending, and strengthening in the United States supply chain, industrial base, and information technology. The current and future defense budget provides confidence for us in our investments that we're making in our R&D that is driving innovation from our concepts to our program of records in support of the warfighter. Our heritage and technical advances in robotics and autonomy, sensing, protection systems, and electrification are aligned to our customer and our mission. And in partnership with our industry peers, we will provide a strong platform for organic growth augmented with the right acquisition to accelerate and increase our growth rate. We believe that our investments in defense and security are highly relevant to a number of modernization activities that are designed to address the emerging threat of our near-peer adversaries and in support of our allies. So let me talk a little bit about Kinetic US at a glance. Kinetic US is a solid company. It's a phenomenal organization built on over 20 years of innovation, investment, and extreme customer intimacy that's allowed us to continue to maintain and grow that portfolio. We primarily sell high value services and products to United States Department of Defense and our national security agencies. We're positioned to enhance our offerings to United States defense modernization programs and platforms, a few of which I'll talk about in just a minute. And the core of our, our family is our robotics, as you've heard throughout the presentation today. It's an area that is consistently evolving as we move from larger, as moving from small form factors to larger form factors, some of which you've seen in our demonstration bef before, and in, as well as the integration of autonomous systems, sensors, and protection capability. In robotics, our core customers continue to be the United States Army, Combatant Command, Ground Vehicle System Center, and the Marine Corps Warfighting Laboratory. We also have a significant amount of technology services, and our engineering services span across the DOD customer, our intelligence customer, and as well as partnership with our industry peers. In these areas, we provide support in areas of communication, sensor integration, research and development, survivability, and unmanned ground combatant systems. We have a solid established base, strong engineering organization, 
systems engineers, technologists, mechanical engineers, software developers, over 600 employees deployed near our Washington DC, Boston, and Pittsburgh area. And in the US market, we have good depth in four of the six unique global capabilities that have been mentioned by Sam previously. Mainly in exper experimentation and technology, engineering and support, autonomous systems and robotics, and information advantage and sensing. We continue to develop the next generation of offerings and posting for multi-domain solutions. And as can be seen from the revenue graph, we have grown, we continue to grow. We are focused on sustained profitable growth. And we expect that as the budget continues to grow in the areas that we are focused and our investment on, that we'll have the opportunity to capitalize on those unique markets as well. We're continuing to look at the balance of our portfolio between products and services, making sure that we're flexing to deliver the right solutions to our customers as we move from experimentation and single product deployment into a larger market of battle space multi-domain solutions. And as you expect, our United States Department of Defense, the intelligence community, and the associated agencies are our current and will be our future primary customers, as well as our industry partners that we've currently partnered with and we're looking to expand those relationships across that portfolio. Holistically, I start, as I started, we have a solid foundation of which we're building upon. The areas where we're strong, we're looking to move and work with those customers, those areas and capability that we've got single point of focus, we're looking to move to those adjacent markets. And we're focused on our people, our processes, and our tools, and we're looking to build a, a leadership team and invest in a strong pipeline that drives that sustainable growth and project trajectory. So let's talk a little bit about our strategy. So our strategy looks to expand across the customer base in the DOD, intelligence, cyber, and IT markets, as I alluded to. And as we discussed in the market dynamics, there continue to be strong for defense contractors across the United States. As Sam alluded to, there's a tremendous amount of competition, but it also creates a tremendous amount of opportunity when you're able to bring your expertise, your right investment, and the right partnership to go after the market. Our US customers continue to respond to the current and emerging threat there is, and there's a high demand for both products, but also services and the integration of those products and services in a multi-domain threat environment. It creates what we call effectively a joint all-domain combatant command control capability. And essentially what that really means is that you're not gonna have just one sensor or one platform. You're not gonna have one comm system or one vendor. You're gonna have a multi-environment where you have one-to-many, many-to-many sensor and capability environment. The United States also recognizes most recently by General Austin's comments, Secretary of Defense, that with any threat that we face, we're gonna, fr we're gonna face that in a joint environment, right? So our organizations and our systems have to have interoperability across the board with our allies. And all of that creates opportunity for us as we think globally across the whole of the portfolio. In particular, we have three core areas today that we're continuing to expand in. Those are land, air, and maritime. And I'll tell you just a little bit about where we are in each of those markets and how we think we can continue to grow. In land, we continue to see growth in both the United States and international market for our robotics, with greater levels of operational deployment domestic and internationally. The robotic market is globally the robotic market is estimated to be over 15 billion for 2022, with a 9.5% year-over-year growth throughout the calendar year and over into 2023. In the US, that market is roughly 5.7 billion for 2022, which represents about 38% of the global market and expected to grow. In particular, what we see is the integration of autonomy, sensors, and protection capabilities into the robotics market, and the defense robotics market is inclusive of all and have been deployed approximately around 90 countries to date, many of which we continue to serve both where we have today and where we're pivoting to go in the future. So our future growth is projected in part by the advancements of the integration of those technologies, the integration of our capabilities, and the interoperability and commonality across the board in the market. We believe that to continue to be a strong focus and a strong market for us across the board. In air, 
the United States air market represents over 16.8 billion for aircraft and related systems. In addition to that, there's additional 46 billion or so market growth capability for mission support and for C4I. So again, go back to that integrated communications, integrated platform, sensor to sensor capabilities that is driven by the air domain. We see an opportunity to continue to play a greater role in autonomy here the, and the integration of our sensors as the platforms start to fly in a multi-domain, multi-platform sensor capability. And the adjacent markets include for us our sensors, communications, collision avoidance, and object detection and classification. In maritime, there's around 5.2 billion in shipbuilding and maritime systems. You'll also see us talk a bit about large unmanned surface vehicle, medium unmanned surface vehicle, and large unmanned undersea vehicle capability. Our current programs are in the Ford class carriers and Virginia class submarines, and they give us a great opportunity to expand our capabilities into the operation and modernization, ship surface modernization, electronic grounding of units, and logistics and sustainment. There's potential expansion also to take some of those capabilities into the international aircraft capability. From a market positioning aspect, we see the opportunity to grow from that unique service provider, some of those unique products that you see in our, in our exhibit today, to being a mid-tier systems platform integrator across that multi-domain battle space. For a great example of that, if you go back and take a look at the Joint Unmanned Systems Roadmap, they talk not just about products going into the battle space or going into an area of responsibility, they talk about interoperability, common architectures, compliance, test and evaluation, verification and validation. They talk about autonomy, artificial intelligence, machine learning, increased efficiency and effectiveness. They talk about security, secure comms, secure network, cyber operations and information assurance. And they talk about human machine collaboration with human machine interfaces, machine teaching, machine learning, virtual reality, and augmented training. All are areas that we see as opportunities for Kinetic US to continue to both play in, partner in, and continue to grow. We're targeting our investments and partnerships to enable that platform-to-platform -platform integration to deliver the multi-domain services and products. And we're expanding our role as a systems integrator with particular focus in autonomy and robotics capability in those specific domains. When you think about the heritage that we have, our organic growth in those markets are actually pretty strong. When fused with the right capability from strategically selected acquisitions and industry partners, we believe it makes us a great platform systems integrator in the United States defense market. We're also looking to expand our business relationships so those areas where we've provided fantastic product and fantastic take capability, we're looking to expand across that value chain from the engineering and design to the systems integration to the deployment and integration of multiple systems to the test and evaluation and finally to the O&M sustainment component which has a modernization component to any one of the programs that we're talking about. And all of these improvements for us add up to a progression in our current strategy. We're migrating from that product developer and, and, and intimate service provider to that multi-domain, mission-led innovation partner. From a foundational perspective, and to underpin all of what I've talked about, we have three prim primary core areas to our business. The first, we're adapting our leadership team to align to our next growth phase. It provides us with a better structure, our capability to drive both organic and acquisition-based growth strategy. In addition to the investing in our leadership team, we're investing in our engineering and our technology team. We're making vital investments to improve that they have the skills, the training required to be able to do some of the high-end technology integration that we just talked about. We're also ensuring that we have an integrated strategy and roadmap that focuses both on internal research and development, but also customer research and development, which we call CRADA. Both of those are important to be able to take the initial concept work with our user community, flourish out those ideas, and bring them to life ultimately into a program of record. Second, we're upgrading and transforming our environment to be digital engineering um, enabled. We're supporting our sisters systems to enable to stay ahead of that competition. 
So when you think about digital engineering and digital transformation, it's not just technology. It's a way to design your systems that bring down cost, bring down risk, but allow you to get to market faster and in a way that a customer can consume. It also helps our customers maintain and reduce their logistics and sustainment, the, we call it the back end of the program of record. And it allows us to train the warfighter in a way that's more agile and quickly as the systems continue to morph and modernize across the portfolio. So in addition to increasing our productivity, the digital engineering environment that we're investing in, it provides that innovation and collaborative development environment that allows us really to go to market in a different way than they've seen Kinetic US before. And last, but certainly not least, building upon what Sam talked about a bit earlier, we continue to ramp up our leverage of global capability by now utilizing our terminology called single route to market. We believe that this gives us the ability to generate and sustain a more intimate relationship with our customers by making sure that we're bringing great technology developed in one country and meeting the need that we may have um, in the OCONUS or continental United States of America. For that, our pipeline and our captures are really focused on, as Steve alluded to, um, a stronger strategy, qualified pipeline, and ensuring that we're bringing the right capability to the right technology to the customer with the voice that speaks to their mission. Overall, what I'm most excited about is that we're building a sound capability base, one that is positioned to become a primary innovation partner to the defense customer in the United States market. So I want to talk a little bit about what does that mean and how do we start to move across that value chain. I have for you just three great examples that start leveraging the investments that we had in the portfolio. And in some cases, many of these started with capability, still exists today, that capability is going very strong. What we've taken a look at is how can we take that capability with some, some significant focused investment and move them into a larger part of the portfolio or an adjacent market. I'll start first with experimentation and technology. So you know we're well known for our robotic products in the market as we've talked a bit about, but we've also been well known for our protection systems or survivability. In particular, we've invested in our refined armor technology and it built upon our existing position has generated a lightweight detachable armor capability for use in multiple types of aircraft for the United States Air Force. The high performance and ease of fitting our armored solutions provide a real-time capability in our current fleet of a C-130. The investment that we've made was to make that current capability lighter and more usable. So not only are we able to take that going back into the C-130 retrofit, which allows them to save on, on space and weight and gas, but it's also now a key technology that we're using to use for their future opportunities and future vertical lift, which needs that lighter weight capability, but still needs the full force of survivability. Future vertical lift for us is a, is a game changer for us to be able to go into a program of record with capability that was created with one program, invested, and now matured and moving up the value chain in the market. We've talked a bit about our autonomous systems and robotics, and again, as you've seen, we've have some fake fantastic capabilities in the back. You're likely aware that, as I've mentioned, we have over 20 plus years of experience in building robots. Everything from our, uh, I, I, which I think is the very cute spur and system in the back, to our more integrated system of our talent organization. But what you should know is that we're now integrating our autonomy capabilities our sensing capabilities, our engineering capabilities. And what we see now is the next generation of robotic combat vehicles, RCV, is now in procurement where we've delivered eight of those units going through tests. And we see that continuing to move down an, uh, a procurement train to go into a program of record over the next two years. That's a great opportunity where we've started with one form factor. We continue to grow and enhance that, that capability. And we're now moving into from the individual product unit sale of one-off robots or robots into certain specific missions into a broader mission and a program of record that will span multiple years, multiple domains for our customers. And then information advantage and sensing. We've talked a bit about our electrical optical and infrared or EOIR sensor capability. What you see now across the United States Air Force market, in particular in low cost attributables or those planes that fly without a manned entity in the, in the organization, in the head, they look for sensors that, that do more than, one pat, uh, more than one platform or more than one payload. So we've looked at how can we integrate 
our sensor capability, our hyperspectral sensor, our EOIR sensors that allow those planes to fly with multiple missions. It allows the United States government to take more use of what they currently have, be able to go into different contested airspace and environments. And for us, this is an area where we've taken an investment that was built for one mission, and we're now helping our government customers see how it can serve multiple missions in multiple domains across the whole AOR. So our ambition for growth in the United States remains, remains strong. We continue to focus on our reforming our U.S. business. We've carefully aligned our programs to where our U.S. customers will seek to sustain and upgrade capability. We want to continue to leverage our research and development position for new programs of record. And from a scale perspective, we're integrating our U.S. defense and security business across the board, continuing to leverage our global capability. We continue to want to grow in the U.S. market over the next five years, both organically and inorganically, with really deliberate strategic acquisitions to enhance our capability. We want to leverage the capabilities aligned with the modernization agenda. So when you think about where the government is now moving towards needing to have systems and integration of platforms across the whole of the domain, we believe that our market position there as a systems integrator for platform for platforms is a great opportunity for us to go into those opportunities. And in, mar in our market opportunities, we're especially focused on cultivating the right relationships with our customers and expanding our relationships with our industry partners being clear on our role and how we can provide value across the whole. So we see opportunities in land, air, maritime, but we also see opportunities in artificial intelligence, cyber, and information technology, which are new markets to us, but certainly markets that support the whole of the mission of our customers that we currently support. I'd like to close by thinking a little bit about why Kinetic was for me. I worked with Kinetic back when I was at my previous company, SAIC, I remembered how they showed up. I remembered the partnership that I had with them. And most importantly, I remembered the phenomenal technology and capability of the men and women who supported me on that particular effort. The opportunity to come into an organization that has a solid foundation and apply our strategic strategy and pivot towards really truly profitable growth was an opportunity for me to really come in and bring and be part of an exciting journey that's just in the beginning, but has much more to come. With that, I'll take your questions. Great, thank you, Sean. Charlotte was up in a nanosecond for a question. One here, Asha. Yeah, that's great. Hi, Charlotte from Hi. Barclays. Hi, Sean. Um, I'm just picking up on your comments around um, multi-domain solutions, joint environment, and interoperability between platforms. It feels very much like your ambition is to sort of move up the value train. Um, yeah. And if I overlay that with the comments that Sam made earlier around the quality of the pipeline improving, um, so the sort of value and duration of bid opportunities is, is on the up. H how do you, I mean, by moving up the value chain, inherently there's a, more, there's a different risk profile to that as well. I just wondered if you could comment around um, the sort of contractual and operational mitigations as you take on more work, of higher value, um, and more complexity ultimately. So it's a great question. Um, when I think about, one, absolutely trying to move up the value chain, and in, in general what we're trying to look at is not move into customer domains that we don't have customer intimacy or we don't understand the mission. So I think maintaining our mission-led innovation is a really key point to how we do that. The relationships that we have with the customers, we understand how they're using the product or understand how they're, they're facing the adversary in those contested environments. But what we want to be able to do is also help them with the intelligence component that starts in the beginning, as well as the integration of the data that gets collected in theater. So many times that data through our robots and our sensors is not brought back and then informed back to the next Intel mission. So we see it as a natural component of the entire part of the intelligence life cycle of the processing, exploitation, and dissemination component, right, of the mission of the customers. So for us, we think we're buying down risk by being able to do that, going into a market where we already have that customer intimacy. It also, though, requires us to have investment in our people, as I mentioned, and in our technology. I think those two are two really core. Digital engineering allows you to have repeatable processes, 
repeatable systems. It allows you to burn down risk on your test and evaluation. But for us, partnered with, for example, Mike Stewart, our CTO, we're creating commonality around our engineering platforms, our engineering processes. We're having centers of excellence of our software development, partnered centers of excellence with our hardware and our electrical development. And then we're giving training to our people to be able to really buy into that and live into that. And so people, processes, and tools are a core part of the investment this year to be able to supplement those programs and efforts that we're going after. Is, is that something you feel is actually missing in the market in the US at the moment? Is that a niche opportunity for you to bring these different products and services together? Yeah. So I can't speak to prior um, uh, areas, but I would tell you that it's harder in general for legacy companies to pivot. And the ability for us to have the agility to bring that into where we want to go now, I think is an absolute right opportunity for where we are in the market. Yeah, that's very interesting. And if, and if I can add, Charlotte, I think if you connect what Sam talked about in terms of the pipeline and the opportunity, you're right, more generally, the company is going up the value chain. And you know, we've talked about winning larger, longer term opportunities. You've just uh, talked about that. And I think it's been very important for us to you know, understand risk you know, as we go up that value chain and make sure exactly as Sean is saying, you know, we continue to invest in the right people, processes uh, and governance actually to make sure that we can manage and execute you know, our strategy and deliverability of the various programs that we win. And uh, that's absolutely you know, the transition that Sean is you know, now leading you know, in the US. So there's plenty of opportunity. <laughs> it's about focus. It's about discipline <coughs> of execution to yield. Uh, you heard it from her as well, sustainable, profitable um, growth. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks, uh, David Farrell from uh, Jefferies. Um, in the last year, the US has moved from operating under a proxy agreement to a special security agreement. Can you explain kind of what impact that might have in terms of how the US business grows going forward? Um, please. So I wasn't here for the last year, but I can talk to the last mm. eight weeks. How about that? And That's then I, I'll... I'll, I'll we'll why, why don't we let Neville say a few words on the prior period and then you can talk Absolutely. about the eight weeks. Neville, do you want to talk a little... Yes, Neville and I were many years to transition <laughs> from a proxy to an SSA, so, um, yeah, so we, we, rich we've, experience. We've had an SSA for a couple of uh, years now, which was enabled by the acquisition of uh, MTech. In the previous um, expansion in the US, we were operating under a proxy agreement, which is more restrictive than an SSA. And a particular feature of an SSA is you can get your exec directors, so in this case, Steve and Carol, uh, with oversight on the board, in the minority, but uh, on the board of the uh, SSA company. And therefore, they get much greater transparency and engagement with the way the company develops. So that's a, a really important point on that. And it's working pretty well, frankly. Yeah, thanks. So from my view, I think it allows us the shift from proxy to SSA to expand the partnership and relationship. Um, it, the specifics around SSA as well as a proxy is that from a United States perspective, we can't reveal United States classified information, which you can't reveal in the United States anyway. Um, you, there's certain data and certain components to the kind of work and what we're doing specifically for whom we're doing it for that we have to maintain. But if you take that for aside for a second, the way we design, the engineering that we were doing, the test and evaluation, the capabilities and how we go to market, they're consistent. My ability to partner with my peers, for example, with James on cyber, on Intel, those are consistent. And in particular in the United States and the United Kingdom, those relationships are, are connected throughout all of the agency, both in the DOD, MOD, and the Intel space in cyber. So I see it as an opportunity to truly leverage a global company. That's the, way I, that's the way I view it. That's the way our leadership team is viewing it. The ability, as, as Greg alluded to, talking about LAN 154, that technology was grown and developed in the United States. The requirements and the customer intimacy are absolutely right with Greg and his team. The ability to combine those two are where we get a leap up there. We have those opportunities in the United Kingdom with robotics and another opportunity, for example, called Dart Rose. We also have the opportunity, as was mentioned before, to take capability that was developed here 
and bring it forward. So the electrification and the hybrid drives that you see were developed in the United Kingdom with our team. They're now being produced and sold down into a key prime customer for a US vehicle on the ground. I think for us, at least the way that we've approached it, we've approached it with a level of collaboration, a level of deliberateness, and the ability where if we've got great capability to bring that capability to market globally within collaboration with each other. Great, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, and I just sort of, Bill, you used the word collaboration. The other word is, I would bring out is skills. So it was, a, it was a huge piece of work to lead to that transition, and it was a really important you know, foundation to shift uh, the U.S. Uh, growth strategy, and you know one of the messages I'm trying to you know, convey today is we have a, you know, an array of global skills. Um, you know one of the questions that we've had is can we grow, you know, in the U.S. You know, and Australia, you know, with Brits from London. Well, you know you'll see a lot of non-Brits that don't live in uh, London, and the SSA transition clearly. We have to respect the U.S. national security. That's what it's there for. It's its primary purpose. You know, we have a gold star with the U.S. government. But we also built, uh, built a board with the right skills and knowledge that have local experience to support Sean you know, and the leadership team and exactly as Sean said, our collaborative. We also um, have seen an evolution to our PLC board structure. So uh, one of the PLC non-execs is now you know, a very rich, uh, experienced uh, individual you know, from the US Defense and Intel. So we've been investing in the right skills and the right mechanisms to support you know, this long-term global ambition. So it's, it's a good question because it is a fundamental enabler for you know, what Sean and the team are now embarking upon. Thanks. Hi, it's Joseph Ayola for Morgan Stanley. Um, can I just come back to test and evaluation? Because if I remember right, uh, last year you were a bit more explicit and added that to your addressable market in, in the US. Um, could you maybe give an update on the opportunity there and how you're thinking about that? Um, potentially organic and inorganically as well, and potential timeframes too. Thank you. I think we were, I'm checking what you were referring to. I think we were talking about the RDT and E budget, which is a, a large collective uh, segment in the United States uh, budget, the way it's aggregated, covering research development, you know, test and uh, evaluation. Um, and I think everything that you know, Sean has really been describing you know, falls um, you know, within that remit. So I think you've heard about the, the <coughs> organic and acquisitive you know, growth strategy through what we've, what we've been through. If I could just build on that, Joseph, one of the areas that we do see is an ability to leverage our core capability that is not resident today in the U.S. market, but bringing forward that past performance into U.S. capabilities. And in general, in program of record in the U.S. market, the O&M component, we call it the, the sustainment component, is what we try to drive down. It's the long tail that happens once a program goes into a program of record, once you get through the prototype, once you deploy, right? It's that O&M sustainment that really is the longevity of the program. And the government customer is consistently looking for ways to bring cost out of that sustained component. So we have a combination of two components that, that, that I think is a market for us to be able to go into. The first is leveraging the past performance and the lessons learned from everyone that you've heard to date. Being able to, to bid those opportunities in a way that would be able to do different if you're just trying to do it without just people person, people base. The second is the technology investments that we're talking about because digital engineering truly goes after the logistics and sustainment. So think about the way you can, you can uh, reduce the amount of spares you need, your depot becomes digital, and the training that you need as you have war fighters, soldiers coming in and coming back through, and as the systems get modernized and have to get continued to rehance. And then in addition to that, our overall rate structure is extremely attractive for that component in the U.S. market in particular. So we see that as an area of opportunity that with that kind of strategic lens of past performance, the right systems, and the right um, cost factors that we were able to go in and partner, that's an area where we want to continue to partner with some of our industry peers, where we're very strong on the front end, engineering design and delivery, but we haven't pulled the relationship all the way through to the sustainment component. Great. Thank you. Okay, other questions? 
Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Okay, and we'll move to our, our last, our last item. So, Carol Borg. Carol, if you'd like to say a few words to remind um, <laughs> everyone who you are and a bit about our financials.